So, very happy with the product. Um, you know, whenever you can get, first of all, Coach Whitman, sit him down and talk to him uh, as we did last January before he passed away in June, which was kind of his last really serious sitting interview. Um, so that, that, that in itself is just, you know, classic kind of footage and, and, and just a, a great, great opportunity for us as a company and, and me personally, just to have stuff that I can look at years from now. He talked about so many things, Remember League Baseball, he talked about his favorite players in the NBA, Kobe wasn't it. He talked about a whole lot of things uh, with us about sports and and, 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 and and things that weren't related to sports. So so yeah, I mean I'm, I'm happy that the coach was involved. I'm happy that Kareem allowed us to, to interview him and get some insights that Bill Walton, uh, Ben Holland, Jamal Wilkes, just a lot a lot of terrific uh, terrific insights from people who were coaching close with him. Were there things that you didn't know before that you found out from doing these interviews just recently? Yeah, well, one of the things is that uh, when he came in contact with some of the old Negro League baseball players who were barnstorming through Indiana at the time, he was playing semi-pro baseball, and uh, there were a couple of Negro League baseball players who took, took him aside and taught him how to turn a double play correctly. You know, And I knew he was a baseball fan, but I, I didn't know that he played semi-professionally uh, baseball. And that I knew baseball, he's always talked about it being his first love, but when he talked about actually meeting up against some of the old Negro League stars and playing against some Josh Gibson and people like that. I mean, that was just fascinating for me to learn. Uh, playing against uh, the Harlem Wrens, uh, an all-black basketball team with, that was the first African-American World Championship team in the late 30s, I believe. But uh, they used to barnstorm against the team he played for in Indiana. And uh, just some of the stories he told us about that. So it was a lot of, a lot of things. Uh, you know, he's just got such a rich history, you know, that uh, it's just amazing sitting down and hearing him talk about some of that. Do you think that some of those experiences like you're talking about is kind of what created his attitude later on that we know so well where at a time where schools like Kentucky wouldn't allow a black player on their team and there's those times that coach Wooden would, wouldn't participate in a tournament if they wouldn't allow black players. Do you think experiences like that contributed towards his attitude? I think it did. He talked again very openly about growing up in Martinsville, Indiana and then being um, really good friends with a couple of black families that were in town and they played ball together, they hung out together and you really got the sense from talking to Coach Wooden, I don't know what the rest of the, the community was like in Martinsville, Indiana, but talking to Coach Wooden and, and his family, that, that, that color was never really an issue with him. And, and, you know, and it's really easy to say that, but, but I really believe that just listening to him talk and talking to people and interviewing people who knew him and uh, knew of him back in those days. And then the, the Clarence Walker story you're talking about in Indiana State, one of his players wasn't going to be allowed to play in the NAIA tournament in Kansas City. This is the late 40s. The coach said, if he had to play, I'm not taking my team. So those kinds of actions by Coach Wooden, you know, you know, 70 years ago, 60, 70 years ago, I'm not good in math, 60, whatever it was, but, but to, to, to take those kinds of stands back in, in those times, which were unpopular stands, it just gives you an idea of, of his, his beliefs about everybody being treated equally. I know it's out of your hands, you couldn't do anything about it, but when you were playing and when you were in school, you were there for the transition. Do you have maybe any regrets about that, that you just didn't have more years with Coach Wooden coaching <laughs> every, every day of my life. Yes, I do. Really? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you go to UCLA to play for Coach Wooden. You go there. I went there thinking that I was going to win a minimum three championships. First one with Bill Walton and, and, and Keith Wolfe to Dave Myers was a no-brainer. And then we knew that, that we had a great freshman class that Coach Wooden was going to find a way to get it done. So uh, right off the bat, you're thinking you're going to win just national championships just kind of automatically. And then for him to retire after my sophomore year, 19 years old, so it, it, it felt it was a bit of a loss. I mean, it was a bit of a loss, and it was one of the reasons why Gene Bartow, one of the greatest coaches, when you look at his record in terms of taking teams to Final Fours, a couple of different teams, that's why he had such, a, I think, a tough time because we were so used to doing things one way, Coach Wooden's way, and even though Coach Bartow's way was successful, it was it was, it was uh, diametrically kind of opposed to Coach Wooden's way, which you never talk about your opponent, don't talk about wins and losses. We had scouting reports with Coach Bartow. We talked about our, about our opponents extensively. So those little things, I thought. Uh, um, yeah, you know, it hurt Coach Barto in terms of being able to be as effective as he could, he could be, and that's one of the, the, the hazards of trying to follow the footsteps of someone like a John Wooden. And obviously, being you know going into college, you just said that you had goals, you had dreams of winning at least three national championships. I get the feeling now when kids go to college, they don't think about that. They think, all right, you know, maybe I'll be one and done. I'm going to jump to the pros or whatever. Do you feel at all disappointed that 
guys don't set those types of goals or do, do you even get that feeling? Well, you know, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not disappointed. And, and tremendously disappointed. It, it, there is some regret that the game or the, or the attitude of the younger players has maybe devolved to that level. But at the same time, being the father of five sons myself, I kind of understand a lot of the, the me first kind of mentality that, that's going on. And, and, and I, I don't blame youngsters today because they see the, 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 mon the monetary successes that people have, like Carmelo you know, Anthony's and LeBron James coming out of high school, Kevin Garnett, and they automatically assume that it's for them. But the thing that, that I get more concerned with is that they don't understand the amount of work and, 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 and the dedication that these guys put into their craft as basketball players. And so they want to just kind of, okay, if, I, if I'm good in high school, I'll be good as a, as a college player, and I'll jump to the pros after my... Now, you know, it's the work that way for everybody. You have to be blessed, you have to work hard, a lot of things have to kind of come together to have that kind of success. What's your absolute favorite Coach Williams story? Well, I've told it several times, but it's, it's the, it's the uh, pool hall story when I was, uh, I think, a sophomore at UCLA. Maybe a freshman, I don't remember exactly what, but I was in the pool hall, shooting pool like I shouldn't have been doing, uh, and in between classes, but, but, but Coach Wooden walks by from the lunch area, sees me, does a double take, backtracks, comes into the pool hall, doesn't say a word to me, extends his hand, asking for my pool cue. I give it to him, not knowing what to expect. He leans over the pool table and begins to run off about six or seven balls in a row. He's got a toothpick in his mouth, a powder blue sweater, and he's leaning over with the toothpick, just shooting and shooting, everything is going in. And then he walks back over to me, hands me the pool stick, and just walks out. And so later on he told me that he shot a little bit of a little bit of pool when he was a youngster back in Indiana. But what's interesting is that that when I told Kareem that story, he told me the same thing happened with him and Lucius Allen, same exact situation that Mike Warren back in the 60s, pool hall, coach walks in, asks for the pool cue, and just runs the table. So I mean that, that's my all-time favorite just, just because of the way it happened and, 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 and how good he was shooting pool. Uh, I'll close it up with this asking you about the upcoming season for UCLA. Got all the transfers from North Carolina, the Ware Twins and Larry Drew. How do you think they're all going to fit in and what are your expectations for the year? I think they're going to be good and I say that because I, you know, I, I, I really like um, Reeves Nelson even though emotionally at times you know he could, he could do a better job of getting a handle on things but he's a young guy and but a terrific talent and it showed that he was willing to put in the work in terms of how much he improved from his freshman year to his sophomore year. I did the game where he had like 27 and 18 rebounds against Arizona. So when he puts his mind to it, he, he is an elite college basketball player. And you throw in the Wear Twins and the size they bring, and they were great just in terms of practice last year. Uh, Josh Smith, I think coming back this year, I don't know what the weight situation is, but he's a very talented player who will gain, if nothing else, if, if not weight or lose weight, he'll gain maturity coming into his second year. And then the backcourt, I think, is, is, is solid, especially with Zeke Jones, a senior out of Chicago, and uh, Jeremy Anderson, who I thought played so much better his, his junior year compared to his sophomore year in terms of confidence. So I'm, look forward, I'm looking forward to big things from this team. They got, and then the Wear Twins, gonna bring, they're going to bring a great size on the inside, mobility, outside shooting, depth coming off the bench. And so there's enough bigs, enough enough guards, enough shooting, I think, with Tyler Lamb. Even though you lose a Malcolm Lee and a Tyler Hunnick at two all Pac-10 level players, I think what they've got coming back, based on what the Pac-10 has coming back, you still have still one of the top 215 in the conference.